Good morning and welcome to Morning Mail. Today is Tuesday, November the 9th, 2021. Good to be with you today. Hope that you've had a good day. It's got off to a good start at least. And appreciate you taking your time to join with us this morning as we look at our Morning Mail from the New Testament letters. And this morning we're going to be beginning a look at the very short one chapter book of Philemon. One of the few letters, personal letters, that we find in the New Testament, as Paul writes to a brother in Christ by the name of Philemon. And we'll see the purpose of that as we go through over the next several mornings. Let's begin our time this morning with prayer, and then we'll get right into looking at verses 1, 2, and 3 of the book of Philemon. Gracious Father, thank you so much for the day and the past night's rest. We thank you for keeping us through the night, blessing us with this new day and with the opportunities that that will be coming our way. And we pray, Father, that you would grant us the strength and wisdom, the courage to face those opportunities, take advantage of them, and use them for your name's honor and glory. Father, thank you so much for our Jesus, your son, who came and gave his life for the Bible, your word, that guides us and directs us, that tells us of your love, mercy, and grace, and tells us what we need to do in order to be found in Christ. Father, we continue to lift up before you those who are grieving in the loss of loved ones. We had a funeral here yesterday in Hereford as our sister Kay Barron's uh, passed away last week. We pray you'd be with Clarence and the rest of the family. And Father, from my um, family, uh, a cousin, Larry Doughty, has lost his wife, Lena, and her services this afternoon. And I just pray, Father, that you'd be with Larry and the rest of the family uh, as they uh, go through this day. Bless us now this morning in our time together in this morning mail. Help us to seek to know your will and do it in our lives. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, <clears throat> I have never experienced the wake of destruction left behind and devastation left behind by tornadoes or hurricanes or any other natural disaster, as we often call them. As a young man still living at home, a tornado struck downtown Lubbock, Texas in May of 1970. Of course, living at home, I was living in Idaloo, just 10, 12 miles away. That's the closest I've been to weather like that. Perhaps you have more first-hand knowledge. My point is, and getting started this morning, that storms, like tornadoes and hurricanes, leave behind them a wake of devastation and destruction. But tornadoes are not the only things that leave a clear path behind. If you ever looked up into the sky, noticed the uh, jet aircraft passing by and leaving ribbons of white in their presence, uh, leaving ribbons of their presence, sea vessels going out to sea in the water, churning through the green water, leave a path. Whenever something of immense power passes, its wake, quote-unquote, leaves telltale signs. Such is true of the gospel. So powerful is God's word that its wake is filled with telltale signs revealing its impact. Paul will discuss a portion of this impact, excuse me, of this impact <clears throat> in Philippian, Philemon, the first three verses. Let's read those verses together to get started this morning. Philemon, verses 1, 2, and 3. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved brother, 
and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As the gospel passes through the lives of men and women, it leaves specific evidence of its impact. This evidence is clearly seen here. Let's look at a few of these. First, it leaves an impact upon relationships. The book of Philemon provides a marvelous insight to the relationships shared in Christianity. In Philemon, we see how Christianity enables a smooth harmony between unbelievable personality and ethnic types. First, there was Paul the Apostle. He was a Jewish scholar, trained from early youth with an arrogance toward Gentiles and women. It is reported that in his prayers, a, a Jewish man would thank God for not making him a Gentile or a slave or a woman. In early adulthood, Paul was enmeshed in bitter opposition towards Christians. The second person mentioned here is Timothy, Paul's son in the faith. The third person was Philemon. Philemon was a well-to-do Gentile businessman. He had been trained by social prejudices to hold contempt for any Jew and to regulate others out or re, to relegate others outside his social strata as inferior. As an owner of slaves, he was tempted to scoff at the idea of humane treatment of his fellow man. The fourth person mentioned was Aphia. It is thought that she was Philemon's wife. If so, she was a woman of status and wealth. Her high standing would make her smug and arrogant. Now, there is a fifth person mentioned, and not in our first three verses, but he will become very important in this little letter, and that is a man by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave who had deserted Philemon, and in departing, evidently had taken valuables from his master. Now, these five people would be considered impossible mixes. Given the normal society structure and prejudices of the first century, there was no conceivable way these five could ever be one. But these impossible types, in spite of their ethnic conflicts, were all united with one another as they shared something in common, Christianity. This is in, in, indeed amazing. If you think it's amazing that these five could be one, consider this even more amazing op, uh, observation. Notice the titles used to describe each one. Paul is a prisoner. What an amazing change from the proud arrogance that his genealogy called for. And we discussed that a few weeks ago in Philippians 3, verse 8. Philemon is described as a fellow worker. He was united with Paul in a common service. Aphia, Onesimus, and Timothy are brothers and sister. Being reborn into God's family meant that they were bound with new life in Christ. This new life was rooted in a new family, and members of that family shared loyalty. 
friendliness, a common life, obligations, and origin. If the wake of the gospel are in the wake of the gospel, a slave had become a brother, and a Jew gave thanks for a Gentile. Isn't, isn't it amazing how the gospel's power changes relationships? The gospel also leaves an impact upon vocation. As the gospel passed through Colossae, it left behind, quote, fellow workers, end quote. It united <clears throat> various people in a goal of common labor. See Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6. Frequently, the scriptures speak of people becoming fellow workers as they join together to spread the gospel. See 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23. Romans 16, verses 3, 9, and 21 and Philippians 2, verse 25, and 4, verse 3. Now this phrase speaks of a desire to achieve a mutual goal, to become fellow workers with God. No longer do we aim for the singular selfish goals and ambitions, but in unselfish service, we unite together to strive to accomplish God's divine goals. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1. Then, the gospel leaves an impact upon our temperament. As the gospel's power passes through, it leaves fellow soldiers and those who are beloved. These two terms describe the temperament that characterizes God's servants. The word soldier describes the temperament toward the world. As a soldier, we must endure conflicts with the world. 2 Timothy 2 verse 3, Philippians 2 verse 25. There must be an aggressiveness in our attitudes because no soldier was ever victorious through being timid. See 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. If we are to become, in, become a soldier toward the world, we are to become beloved toward the Lord's church. The term beloved describes the temperament we are to, to demonstrate toward our brethren. The true mark of discipleship is in accepting and tolerating an attitude of the beloved. See John 14, 34, John 15, verses 12 and 17. Then the gospel leaves an impact upon self. In the wake of the gospel's power, there is a dramatic change in our inner self. The gospel provides the greatest good we can ever desire, grace, and peace. These two blessings provide an, inter, an, an inner comfort and contentment that is available nowhere else. The gospel gives us God's grace, that is, the favor that provides us with the blessed state of reconciliation and fellowship with our Father. As a result, the gospel also gives us Peace. Peace is a healthy condition, a, an inner harmony, even in the midst of great conflict. It is the tranquility of mind. Romans 5 verse 1. In the wake of the gospel's power, grace is obtained and peace is applied. See Philippians 4 verses 4 through 7 we discussed just last week. From no other source can these two blessings arise. Then, the gospel leaves an impact upon our associations. For those who understand and obey the gospel, 
the Lord's church becomes the sphere of associations. It is the family of God assembled together, worshiping and working together. The association is large enough to, in scope to include all who are in Christ, but is best understood on a local level, the local congregation. This association was by the eternal design of the gospel and is accomplished only by obedience to God's commands. See Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 10. Well, as we survey all of this evidence, it quickly becomes apparent that the gospel's impact will be found if we have properly responded to it. Think about the impact of the gospel's power in your life. Let me help you by asking some questions. First, is there the appropriate change evident? Have you responded to the gospel as you should? If the gospel's power has influenced your life, the relationships you share will be different than before. Paul became a prisoner. That indicated the cost of being a Christian and the commitment essential to following God. Romans 6 verses 16 through 19. Too often this is not evident in our lives and in our relationships. Has the gospel affected your relationship as a fellow worker and a fellow soldier? Are you actively laboring for Christ's cause? Are you aggressively fighting to endure and to conquer sin? See 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20 and 27. Has the gospel brought the appropriate changes to your life so that you now share a common life, common origin, and common obligation with those who are Christians as well? Now, these questions accurately evaluate a critical aspect of obedience. It asks, have you responded to, to the gospel's power? If an appropriate response has been made, there should be a visible impact upon your life and mine. Second, is there an appropriate impact of my life upon those in the world. If I have felt the wake of the gospel's power in my life, I should have an impact upon others. 1 Peter 2.12 If there has been no impact in my life from the gospel, my life will have no spiritual impact upon others around me. Titus 1 verse 16 Third, is there an appropriate understanding of the gospel's power to change my life? See, Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5, and Hebrews 4, verse 2. Those who fail to recognize the gospel's potent power will never be influenced by that tremendous power. Just as powerful storms, such as tornadoes and hurricanes, leave their mark upon the land, the gospel's power left a series of amazing changes in its wake in the first century. Everywhere, people felt its impact. Consider Acts 17, verse 6, Colossians 1, verses 5 and 6. In a world deceived by Satan and deluded by darkness, the force of the gospel was introduced. Its impact left a result eternal in scope. 2 Timothy 1 verse 10. The invasion of the gospel spread the good news of Christ throughout the world. The lost were saved, 
the neglected cheered, and the proud humbled. Enemies became brothers. Love was a sovereign decree which bound all people together in one indissoluble union in the church. This gospel is still filled with power some 2,000 years later. Its impact is still earth-shaking as it continues its trek into the vast darkness of sin. It leaves behind an unmistakable wake. Hearts are cheered and encouraged and souls are saved as obedience is demonstrated. Such a result is God's desire. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Well, on tomorrow's morning mail, we're going to continue in our look at our look at Philemon, and so we'll look at verses 4 through 7 of this little letter. I hope that you can be with me then. Let's pause and bow in prayer as we close our time this morning. Gracious Father, thank you so much for the gospel. What an impact it has upon our world as lives are changed and souls are saved, relationships are different. Things are always so much better. And Father, what an impact the gospel has made upon our own lives individually and personally. It's brought us out of the darkness of sin, made us in given us a new relationship with you as your children, as brothers of Jesus. Help us, Father, to live in that way, that as we go about our activities each day, that in the wake that follows behind us, the gospel will be evident as people see our lives, and the difference the gospel makes, and as we seek to tell those who are lost about the good news of Jesus. Bless us in that effort. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, you go out. Make your Tuesday great. Lord willing, we'll see you back here tomorrow morning.